Our guest is a pediatrician and researcher who considers it his mission to take down health myths and weak medical research. In his new role, he has a bigger platform than ever to share his message. The way that we discuss nutrition and food is a great example of the way that we burn people's belief in science, uh, in that it feels like people are told one or the other, you know, eggs are gonna kill you because of cholesterol. Oh, it actually doesn't matter. Eat as many eggs as you like. You know, red meat will kill you. Oh no, red meat can be part of a diet. You know, drink no alcohol to, you know, you'll read other studies and hear like, oh no, no, drinking red wine is perfectly healthy. When a lot of that is caused by the fact that we're not good at discussing nuance about a research, especially in nutrition. Dr. Aaron Carroll is the newly named president and CEO of Academy Health which aims to improve healthcare by advancing evidence to inform policy and practice. Most people should know that going to extremes can add a tiny bit of risk here or there, but the extremes that we are often sold uh, one way or the other about what you should or should not eat are often not really well supported by, by science. And this is Conversations on Healthcare. Well, Dr. Carroll, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, we know you as a prolific writer, producer of media about healthcare policy and research. We want to get into the specifics in a minute, but first, congratulations on your new role as president and CEO of Academy Health. I think it is a perfect fit because the Academy Health has really been working to improve healthcare by using evidence to inform policy and practice. I'm wondering if you could tell our audience a little more about the work that Academy Health undertakes. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, um, I couldn't have been, I couldn't be more excited to be stepping into this role. Uh, you know, even I've been at, I was at Indiana University for 21 years before this, and I used to joke that there were only one or two jobs uh, that could ever pull me away. This just happens to be one of them. Uh, I mean, Academy Health's, mission is to use data and evidence to prove health and health care for all. Um, and I like to think that, uh, you know, over the course of my career as a, a researcher, it was about how do we take data and evidence and use it in clinical decision support or medical decision making to help health care providers provide better care. Um, in mentorship, it was how do I take data and evidence and use it to improve research and how we train researchers. When I got into science communication work, it was how do we take data and evidence and bring it to the public uh, so that they can make better decisions about health and health policy. Um, and even when I was chief health officer, it was how do we take data and evidence and apply it to public health in a pandemic response or the improvement of mental health. And all of that was taking data and evidence and, and using it to improve health and healthcare, which is really what Academy Health is all about. The organization okay. is, I'm sorry. I was just, nope, go ahead, go ahead. The organization is the professional home for health services research and researchers and health policy researchers. Uh, we have about 3,000 members. Um, about half of them probably come from universities or academic environment, but others come work for government or for uh, think tanks or for nonprofit or for-profit companies, but all of whom engage in you know, creating the body of, of evidence that, that we can use to improve health and healthcare. We put on a couple big national meetings uh, focused on research or on data uh, or on dissemination and implementation science. Um, and in addition, we do a decent amount of extramurally funded work as well, working with partners uh, to help improve the ways that we can gather and disseminate and produce evidence. And we're, what's well, the Dr. financing model for Academy Health? Is both working with some funders or is there endowment or? I'd say about half our revenue comes from uh, extramural sources, which can which include foundations like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or the Commonwealth Fund or others. Um, we also get some funding from ARC and for PCORI and the NIH for uh, either meetings or individual research projects, which we work uh, with uh, various partners across the country. Um, some of it is obviously membership, um, and some of it is uh, the, some of the big meetings we put on. Our, our biggest meeting is the annual research meeting, which is 
just next week, uh, which usually gets about 2,800 to 3,000 attendees. Uh, we also have Health Data Palooza, which is on September 17th, and the Dissemination Implementation Science meeting, which will be later this year. Well, Dr. Carroll, uh, Academy Health is very well known uh, among people engaged in health services research uh, and other areas. But I'm really curious, uh, as you looked at this opportunity and as you spoke with people and maybe did a deeper dive, how do you think a clinician in the field and practice or an average patient uh, sees Academy Health's efforts in action? Can you point to a few areas where you think Academy Health has really uh, made a big difference for people in recent years in healthcare? So, I mean, some of it is going to be below the radar because mm -hmm. it's definitely in the promotion of the field and, uh, you know, bringing researchers along and helping to advance their careers. Um, but some of our advocacy efforts uh, focus on our policy priorities, promoting research and science innovation. We're constantly talking to the Hill and to the NIH and to other federal funders to, to improve uh, research and science innovation, to improve the health system and, and how we might do research to tell us how to have the United States healthcare system work better. Uh, we focused in recent years on healthcare provider resilience, uh, which has been a big issue since the pandemic. Um, we certainly focus on capacity um, in reducing health disparities uh, and including racial and socioeconomic factors. Um, a lot of these, again, aren't going to be front page, we cured a disease kind of things, right. uh, but it's the bread and butter of health services research, trying to improve the access, quality, and cost of the healthcare system, which definitely benefits all of us. You know, I want to try to balance two things. One was uh, something you wrote about a study that found Americans support the use of data for public health and research purposes. And then sort of the general observation that it seems that the public is not really supporting science as much as they have in the past. But you also talk about uh, the, the, the drop uh, in support by African-Americans, the decrease uh, that they have in terms of, of, uh, of that data. How do you balance all of these out? And what are the consequences if these views really don't change? Well, I mean, there's lots of really good reasons that a variety of different communities don't trust research. Uh, we have not often been honest with them in both in their inclusion in research and, and how they uh, their data is used. We need to do a much better job of that. Uh, we need to be inclusive and honest and respectful in both the invitation and the conduct of research involving all different kinds of communities, especially those from uh, underrepresented groups that, uh, that have traditionally been ignored. Um, in addition, I think science has taken a bit of a hit during the pandemic. Uh, we are not often very good about discussing nuance. Uh, I think too often science has been portrayed as binary, positive or negative, mm -hmm. um, when the truth is it, it really, a lot of it is gray, and each individual study adds a little bit to our complete fund of knowledge. But a lot of people aren't comfortable with that nuance or discussing that nuance. And when you describe things in absolute terms, when the data and the evidence don't warrant it, uh, it creates a climate where people don't trust exactly what you're saying, especially when they see things change. Mm -hmm. I also think we've been, we've, I don't think we've been very good about that, discussing the fact that, that science changes. It is not an absolute thing where we know this all to be true and then we're just adding to it. A lot of the work that we do is completely adjusting some of what we found before uh, and trying to figure out how do we add to it. I'd also say that, that good science communication has to be built around trust and building trust takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Too often we're searching for that soundbite, the perfect tweet or the perfect TikTok video, which will convince everyone what is correct or truth. That is rarely the case. Uh, it's often really sitting and talking and listening and building up trust and answering the same questions over and over and over again, uh, trying to get people to understand why we think things are the way they are, where the gaps are and how they might change in the future. We need to do better. You need those disclaimers on the bottom that with more data points, we may change our minds or no? I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I like to think that when I wrote, you know, when you read a column that I've written or a video that, that I've produced, uh, what you see is not just an explanation of 
what I think is correct, but why? You know, in a discussion of the entire fund of knowledge, even if we're discussing a new study, how that is placed in context with what we know before. What are the pros and cons of the, the research methodology that was used? You know, what is it? How assured are we of certainty? How many, how much of a change should this make us uh, enact? That again, unfortunately, takes time. It is not how you you know can discuss things on cable news. It's not how you can discuss things in a very short video. It requires a longer conversation, um, mm -hmm. and it's it's one of the reasons I think that that you know people so often aren't getting the full story, and then when they hear something else, they they worry that. Uh, that things just aren't true. It, it's nuanced. And I, while I don't think we need to say a disclaimer of, you know, this can change at any time, um, because some things we are more assured of. The overwhelming amount of data, for instance, that we have that uh, vaccines don't cause autism um, means that even if a new study comes along, a new cohort study or case control study that might appear to differ, that has to be placed in the context of an overwhelming amount of data from randomized controlled trials and large studies. Um, it's worth always discussing that broader context. And as we develop more and more data and we get more and more assured, then newer studies shouldn't move us as much. Mm -hmm. But when it's new, hot information, then clearly things are not yet set and they can move. Well, Dr. Carroll, one of your uh, Academy Health, I should say, big initiatives is research on how to build trust between communities and clinicians. Now, you can look at that a lot of different ways. Yep. Uh, how do I feel about my primary care provider? But it's also how do I feel about my hospital, uh, yep. my health system? How do I, as a member of a certain community, feel about these institutions? Tell us more uh, about this. We, we certainly know all the data for 20 or 30 years that nurses are the most trusted people, but people's primary care provider, uh, what they often refer to as their personal physician, I think is probably uh, a close second. So what are you studying and what are you learning? Well, part of what I think we're studying is, is how to measure and mm -hmm know if there is trust or mistrust because too often we just rely on anecdote or or you know what what we might see in social media when really you know even in this high you know everybody's concerned about distrust or that, that no one trusts science again i think if you look at the data on year to year still physicians nurses very highly held in terms of trust even as you know we are worried that we're losing uh, everyone to to disinformation and misinformation on social media so we need to be able to measure these things but i also think we need to figure out what are the critical factors in in building trust um it can't just be your famous and get to be on cable news um we know that we need trusted voices in the communities that are listening, um, because often it requires a trusted voice in the community to actually get people to, 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 to listen and to perhaps change their views. Um, but we're also working on, you know, what are the key components of building trust, keeping trust, and you know, combating misinformation and disinformation, because of course, just throwing things out there, rebutting often doesn't work as well as, for instance, pre-butting, trying to build those relationships and get people to understand how science works and what questions they should ask when they hear new information mm -hmm. uh, is much more powerful than trying to change their minds after they've heard things that are just not true. You know, I want to pull the thread on building trust and keeping trust and thinking about your new position and, you know, what, what might, what changes might you bring or focus that you might bring to your role at Academy Health that works about, that talks about those relationships that need to be built beyond the scientific community to the larger public? Well, I think we need to, to really, really focus on science communication. Uh, I think we also need to get, to change the ways that, that researchers and scientists talk about science. Too often, people are only comfortable discussing the research that they did with their own two hands. If you go to a traditional scientific talk, it's often, let me tell you about a study that we did and why that's important. With very few exceptions, individual research studies rarely change the landscape of, of what we're talking about. They're all adding a small amount to what we already know, um, either reinforcing or perhaps changing direction a little bit. 
but too few scientists are willing to sort of have that general broad discussion about a whole area, which leaves people not understanding the whole context, but also feeling like things are whip, you know, whip, whipping up and back and up and back. Um, I also think we have to to get better at talking about that research is not research, that there are different types of research that that some will, will much more easily be changed into actual practice. Some are more foundational. Some might be hypothesis generating, while others might actually you know, change the things that we think we ought to do in the practice of health or healthcare. Uh, I also think we need to, to have a more honest conversation about all the incentives, which can sometimes, unfortunately, push us away from good reproducible science uh, and recognize that we probably need to reform a lot of the ways that we conduct, fund, report, analyze, and even discuss research uh, in order to, to make people understand its, its limitations as well as its benefits and how we might place it in context to understand the world in a better way. Well, Dr. Carroll, uh, there's so many interesting things underway uh, at Academy Health, but one area that we're uh, intrigued with and would like to know more about is the interdisciplinary research group uh, on nursing practice, nursing workforce, the delivery of care. Uh, how uh, has this initiative come about? What are some of the key areas that it's involved in and, and what do you see on the horizon for that work? Well, one of the most important things I think we've we've learned in the last few decades is that uh, we can't just focus on one aspect of uh, of healthcare. Um, so little is truly fixed, for instance, just in a doctor patient office visit. Uh, there is so much more that occurs, both in the public, both in the use of nurses, uh, both in other practitioners of healthcare. And we have to get better at working with each other as part of teams. Uh, in order to to provide better health care and to to really affect health and not just health care. Um, a lot of the work that we've done focuses, I think, on on workforce and and burnout in recent years, because of course, during the pandemic, while everybody really rallied behind healthcare workers, including nurses at the beginning, uh, over time, um, people just became disgruntled with, the, the response and how we were all responding to COVID, how it was making people feel and having to act. Um, and people also got a lot of misinformation and disinformation, which which led people to, to develop, again, as we've discussed some of this mistrust. Um, it's also led a lot of people to consider leaving the field or to experience burnout. And we have to, to stop that. Um, we had already uh, you know, areas of the country that had a huge lack of medical services, um, a lot of which are provided by nurses, a lot of which are provided by other types of practitioners. And we need to focus on resilience and keeping people feeling valued and trained and able to continue to love the work that they do, because we need a lot of healthcare providers in order to maintain the healthcare system that we have. And we all know it could be a lot better. Well, I think if I could just sort of continue on that for a second, um, and I, I think you were right on about uh, what happened during COVID, that tended to focus uh, a lot of attention and well-deserved on the acute care setting. But we're at a place in the country where maybe 50% of primary care providers in this country today are nurse practitioners. And yeah. yet the conversation is rarely about that, and it's about the shortage of primary care Physicians, is this a research group on nursing issues addressing how we maybe change the public understanding or mindset yeah, about this? I, absolutely. I mean, I think we have to get used to, I should say, you know, all getting every, you know, a full disclosure, my wife's a nurse practitioner. So, you know, take the biases where you uh, where you will. But there's lots of studies that show that uh, nurse practitioners uh, provide some primary care services better um, than physicians. Um and unfortunately, there's still a bias, uh, both within the healthcare system and without, that often they provide substandard care. What I think we have to get better about in general is, is understanding that, that this should be viewed as a team. Um, there's lots of things that nurse practitioners are going to excel at. There's lots of things which PAs are going to excel at. There's lots of things that MAs are going to excel at. And there's lots of things that physicians are going to excel at. There's lots of things that different types of physicians are going to excel at. And we're all part of a team working together, especially in primary care, uh, to provide the best care that we can to get to the best health that we can uh, for individuals. I 
I think I wrote a column years ago, which was, you know, there's a big debate about do we have a physician shortage? And a lot of health services researchers and health policy researchers will argue we don't have a physician shortage. We have a physician or medical services shortage in that we are not properly using all of the people that we have mm -hmm. in the healthcare system to the best of their ability in a way to provide, you know, optimal care. Um, but everyone and especially i think a lot of the work that, that we do focuses on the fact that we need to to get everyone working with each other in teams in order to do the best care that we can but i think we have to prepare the public as well that there's a transformation going on in primary care the number yeah. of nurse practitioners that are in primary care is dramatically increasing the number of physicians who are retiring who simply want to go into specialty care uh is is also increasing right so the, the yeah. world is going to be different for the population. We need to prepare it. And nurse practitioners, we, we would say with residency training, are fully equipped to manage, manage that transition. And it's just facts yes. <laughs> that this is happening. I, I mean, the, we, we had more pediatric, I'm a pediatrician, we had more pediatric slots go unfilled yeah. uh, in this year's match than we've seen in decades. Wow. Um, and. I mean, if we're being perfectly frank, the way that we reimburse primary care services uh, makes it less attractive than it used to be uh, compared to going into other physician, you know, physician specialties. You know, you know, lots of medical students and residents are graduating with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. In, you know, financial incentives matter. And while I'm not arguing that you know, physicians are going to go hungry, uh, I, if you can make a lot more money over here and you already know that you are deep in the hole, more and more people are going to choose that. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the incentives are aligned, unfortunately, to drive a lot of people away from primary care. But there's lots of people who still want to work in the field mm -hmm. and provide that care. They just might not all be physicians. Um, yeah. And a lot of other practitioners, including nurse practitioners, can provide you know, incredibly I, high quality care. I do want to shift, as you said, the word incentive and think about what's happening in the uh, private equity space for hospitals. The, the undermining it seems to be having of the system. It's also eroding primary care uh, as these private equity hospital based health systems are uh, buying up practices, splitting them up, uh, selling them for their for their parts. Talk a little bit about the role private equity is having and what your observations are. Well, I, I mean, we'd be ignoring reality if we didn't, you know, recognize that 18 percent of GDP that which means that almost, you know, one fifth of our economy is based in healthcare. There's clearly a lot of money to be made in healthcare in the United States. It is therefore not, you know, unexpected that private equity would get into that. But, you know, simple economics will tell us that that even in private, especially in private equity, they will be drawn to the parts of the healthcare system that make money. Um, that is not primary care, unfortunately. Uh, and so as more and more of the system focuses on which parts of the system can make money, the parts that don't can be ignored. Uh, yet primary care still does a massive amount of good and necessary work. It just doesn't make a lot of money the way that we have our healthcare system set up. That leaves the system with more and more uh, private equity and, and more and more you know, profit driven focused really being put into the healthcare system means that primary care is going to suffer. Um, at some point, we have to recognize that some things are just a good and that we're going to need to find ways to fund them and support them, even if they don't make huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Carroll, I'm going to uh, pivot to uh, a book that you wrote, which I thought had a great and provocative title, The Bad Food Bible, How and Why to Eat Sinfully. And you've uh, explained that you can eat red meat several times a week, yep. have a drink or two a day, have a gluten loaded bagel from time to time, which sometimes feels like it goes against the advice that we're regularly given. But take us through that advice. What what prompted you uh, in particular? What prompted you to write that book with that message? I mean, it was written well before the pandemic, but I, I think it, it really came out of my frustration as I wrote more and more columns that the way that we discuss nutrition and food is a great example of the way that we burn people's belief in science uh, in that it feels like 
people are told one or the other, you know, eggs are going to kill you because of cholesterol. Oh, it actually doesn't matter. Eat as many eggs as you like. You know, red meat will kill you. Oh, no, red meat can be part of a diet. You know, drink no alcohol to, you know, you'll read other studies and hear like, oh, no, no, drinking red wine is perfectly healthy. When a lot of that is caused by the fact that we're not good at discussing nuance about a research, especially in nutrition. A lot of the work is cohort or case control studies, which point to a potential risk, but we again are binary in our thinking. It's risk or no risk, as opposed to really tiny risk, as long as you're doing things in moderation. Um, and so the book really tries to, to look at foods we've been told are terrible and discuss that really it's a much more nuanced conversation. Um, for some people, there's a risk. If you have celiac disease, of course, you should not be consuming gluten. Mm -hmm. um, if you have incredibly high blood pressure and consume an enormous amount of salt, of course, you should reduce uh, your salt intake. But for tons and tons of the vast majority of people who don't have those issues, then a lot of the changes you make won't make much of a difference at all. Um, and sometimes even randomized controlled trials, when we go from hypothesis generating to let's actually see if changing this makes things better, don't bear out the results that we think that they should. And therefore, most people should know that going to extremes can add a tiny bit of risk here or there, but the extremes that we are often sold uh, one way or the other about what you should or should not eat are often not really well supported by by science. And we should be honest about that and we should be able to have a nuanced conversation again. Well, there should be no nuanced conversation about my love for kimchi and shouldn't write anything bad about it. Sure. But besides <laughs> that, I really want to talk about your public, uh, your, your formulation for good communication, because it seems to me that this is at the core of what science needs to do. And you, you've been remarkable in terms of uh, your ability to make complex healthcare policy understandable. You do this through your blog, The Incidental Economist, and the Healthcare Triage YouTube series. Uh, tell our listeners what your keys to success in making difficult issues relatable. I think it. It's, first of all, I would say a lot of it is practice. Uh, every, you know, I think too many people think that you fall from the sky or are born a phenomenal How did writer. you get to Carnegie uh, Hall? <laughs> exactly, practice. And one of the reasons I actually started a blog was because I wanted to get better at writing. And I said, I'm going to write 800 words a day for a couple of years until I'm better at writing 800 words. And it actually worked. Um, but I think a lot of it is... Um, you know, talking to the public, uh, it's, I wasn't writing the blog. I don't write the column for hardcore researchers or even for academics. It's for regular people. Um, and that forced me over time to get better at talking and writing about things, uh, in ways that people can understand. But I, I think if there were, you know, certain messages that work, it's being willing to question your hard, you know, hardcore beliefs. It's always looking for all of the studies, not just some. It's being willing to discuss nuance, um, and especially being willing to talk about absolute risk versus relative risk. Relative risk is the way that we scare people. You know, we say your risk goes up by fifty-two percent if you do X or Y, when really it's going up from. 0.0001 to 0.00015. And there's a big difference between those two things. And we don't often discuss the absolute risk. I also think sometimes we cherry pick. Uh, we discuss pros without cons or cons without pros. And one of the things that, that builds trust is being willing to discuss the benefits and harms of everything and being able to weigh those and also understand that different people will rationally come to different conclusions about what they want to do based on whether or not they really care about those those harms and those benefits and that we can make different decisions different rational decisions about the same questions based upon our different priorities and sometimes you need to have, when you're speaking truth to power, have a thick skin. You face yes. this issue uh, on your writing about artificial sweeteners. Anything you want to sh share share with our listeners? Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, I, the gist of that column was that a lot of the data and evidence that, that, that say artificial sweeteners are damaging is massively flawed and really overread. And that given that uh, added sugars it's very hard to defend that. And the evidence is overwhelmingly negative. I said, 
I would drink a diet soda any day of the week uh, before a regular soda. This led people to, to actually argue that my children should be taken away from me and that my <laughs> license should be revoked, uh, which I just found I was sort of shocked. I, people are more passionate about artificial sweeteners than almost any other topic I've ever written about. But <laughs> I, I maintained that what I said was true. It's like, I mean, I'm not advocating you should drink a case of Diet Coke a day, uh, but but the occasional diet soda is so much less harmful for you than sugar soda um, and likely has minimal to no mm -hmm. harm. Well, Dr. Carroll, I think it's easy to see uh, why the search committee uh, turned to you as their candidate to lead Academy Health with your, your love of research and getting to the facts, but building trust uh, and also speaking uh, in an open way with people, whether they're healthcare professionals or our friends and neighbors. So thank you for this really enlightening conversation. And we wanna thank our audience for being here and be sure to subscribe to our videos on YouTube. Find us on Facebook and X uh, with the account name CHC Radio. Uh, and as always, please go to chcradio.com uh, to sign up for email updates and also share your thoughts and comments about this program. Dr. Carroll, thank you so much for joining us today on Conversations on Healthcare. And we look forward to more conversations in the future. You're very kind, thank you very much. This copyrighted program is produced by Conversations on Healthcare and cannot be reproduced or retransmitted in whole or in part without the express written consent from Community Health Center, Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own and they do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Conversations on Healthcare or its affiliated entities.